community radio run by volunteers. Log on to our website at dialectradio.co.uk to find out more. My name is Trevor Meelam. I'm a Lloyds Bank victim. I've been into property for 33 years. I set up and founded the um, independent network of estate agents. Um, I believe very much in estate agents working together on a co-brokerage system, much like the Americans, MLS, um, multi-list systems, which actually began in the UK um, and then went to America, grew in New York, Redney, and uh, so on. But the Americans took it in a co-broker way and, and the UK took it in a more of a... Um, Singular agent. Can you can you just people. explain in a nutshell the difference between the diff- the systems? The Americans have got more intelligence to realise that half of something is better than nothing, and you can't sell what you haven't got. So the American system means that as a, a real estate agent, you work for a brokerage. So that could be like a Remax or something like that. But you might, you know, you'll sell your own properties, but you also sell and offer other agents' properties. And if somebody else has got something that somebody wants, it's a lot easier to sell it than trying to pitch something that you've got that nobody wants or the person doesn't want. So the Americans talk about 6% commission, but it it doesn't actually work out a lot different to what an agent would earn in the UK. An agent in the UK roughly works on 1.5%. An American might charge 5 6%, but then half goes to that brokerage and that brokerage. And it gets split again between the brokerage and the, and the realtor. So, so the actual- yeah. So, so what happened with with your banking then? Because obviously, you would have had to, I imagine, borrow some money to invest in this business. Uh, no, we didn't have to borrow any because I had quite a few buy to let properties, and I got bought out on my two estate agency offices, which were very traditional models, and we're fine. So we set up a prop tech. I sold some of my investment properties. And that's fine. And then we had to sell another property and uh, put a bit more money in. But basically, um, we got to a point where we built it up to 650 estate agency offices. And we were near break even on revenue. We, we created a freemium model. The technology that I created was um, next generation to Right Move and Zupa because it was a multi directional property data feed. Whereas right move and Zoopla only take the data from the agent software upwards. So building INIA, um, prior to that, I, I, I got chaired a group called Linear, which was local independent network of state agents. Local because most people move locally. But when I set up INIA, um, we wanted it to be something that could be national. So we, it had to be a technology platform rather than just a paper-based multi-list of the prior system and um, I designed a system I found a really good team of IT down at Hastings um, that way we built um, I suppose we invested about a million pound and along the way um, we had a bit of lending from Lloyd's um, you know we were going to bring more investment in and then I had an idea why don't we take properties to the people on digital screens with our software fee type, which is different to Right Move Zoopla. And Lloyds Bank said, we really like that idea. You'd be applicable for an EFG loan. I said, what's that? And they said, it's the Enterprise Finance Guarantee. You'd be applicable for 200000 So we said, what have we got to do? And they said, well, it's the Enterprise Finance Guarantee. You'd be applicable. And, you know, the idea was we'd use the money we always carried a, a float of about twenty, thirty thousand 30,000 overdraft anyway for the buy-to-let properties we had, so new kitchens, bathrooms, repairs, and so on. But the bank said, you know, you'd be applicable £200,000 loan, EFG, Enterprise Finance Guarantee. You need to come in with a chartered accountant. You need to quantify all your figures, so we've done all that. So it wasn't like it was just guessing it. we we done it properly and plans and forecasts and everything else. Lloyd said, um, yep, we are back you, and so on. So we didn't know the full process, but they increased the overdraft to allow us to build these prototypes that we call remote agent. Once we got a, a prototype in the K 
County Square Ashford. We had another one with the ex-National Association president in Norwich. He had that at golf course. And we had we, we had some agents testing unit, and we had another unit in a, um, a local store. And the idea was we could broadcast properties anywhere, and like a shopping mall where you can't have an estate agent normally because it's retail. You can have digital signage. So we thought, great. Prior to that, I um, approached a little company called Tesco, and I built a floor in. And when Tesco tried to run with the idea without me, I went to the ombudsman and said, they can't do this, Bill. He said, why? And I pointed out a bit of legislation. He agreed, and we pulled the plug on Tesco. But anyway, going back to remote agent and INEA, we got to about 87 foul, and Lloyd's then needed to come through with the other 113, 115, which was our sales and marketing money, all in the plan, mini call centre, sort of four sales people. And... Um, they said no. So what they'd done, they'd increased, put us in toxic debt. They'd increased it on the overdraft and said, you've now got to go to a loan. Because um, we wasn't actually in the EFG. We thought that was just how it worked. It was allocated. And um, I said, this is all going to end in tears. And what they did, they pushed us into the EFG. Um, no, they pushed us into the loan, um, not the EFG. Um, so toxic lending. We then thought that they had deaded the overdraft account in Kent, um, and instead they moved it to Lloyd's BSU. We thought it was deaded. But that's the business support unit. Business support unit, yeah. Lovely lot there. And um, you need business support, you go there. And um, what they'd done, they were running up debt into it. But what we now know from the DSA, the data subject access request, we found loads of gold nuggets in it. We know that um, our local branch had um, closed the um, bank statements down, closed the internet banking, closed the ATM cards. So as far as we knew, we had no way of looking um, for that account. As far as we knew, it was dead. They moved it over to BSU and ran a load of debt in it. They also, we now know, run um, drive-by valuations at two-thirds below market value on our property. Um, we then said on the loan that we were running on, the 87 foul, it was always close to the borderline. And the interest rate, I think, was about 26%. So we were always falling into really heavy toxic debt. And we said, this is just unworkable. Um, it... it We've had a report done by Professor Nigel Harper, and he basically says what they should have done was come through with the full 200 or said to you, no, we're not going to back you on this um, side business plan. Just keep with the main business, which was near break even. But what they did by going midway, they increased us to our real toxic debt and then pulled the rug and nothing then to, you know, no extra funding to furnish the extra debt. Um, we also now know from the DSR that um, staff at Lloyd's were supposed to set up the direct debits that we'd asked for, like Right Move Supla do, to get customer payments in. We've now got the evidence that they should have done that and they kept agreeing to do that, but they, they just never came through with it. So they pushed into toxic debt and made it even harder to get payments in. We've also found in the DSR we found a loan of £250,000 that we never had. So we think um, they gave us toxic lending, which they promised of two hundred, which only went to eighty seven. And then what they've done, they've done a thing called rehypothecation. And then they've gone ahead and borrowed um, 250000 against my name and ID and kept it in shadow banking. So it's, it's really filthy. Um we know what Lloyds do. I mean, for 10 years with INEA, um, I became a government stakeholder advisor to HMRC on the third and fourth money laundering directives. I've also um, worked alongside the Office of Fair Trade, which then went, and um, the current guidance on residential property sales, which is trading standards. 
um, I put a hell of a lot of input into that. So we went along. Um, things really struggled for three, four years. We kept selling our buy-to-let properties. Lloyds were, you know, really nasty charges on our property. And they really pushed us to the limit. Total lies, everything else. Um, we we then got um, paperwork that we had to go to court. And they used Ashford's Law. Horrible lot. Real rats in the mud. Um, they lied on affidavits, that sort of thing. Um, I then found SME Alliance and on Twitter other victims. And I started talking to people. And one lady that had been pushed by Nat West and Ashford's Law, her husband had tried three times to kill himself. And the poor lady told me that one time her and her children found him and he'd taken a bottle of cognac and 64 painkillers. But equally, Ashford's Law said to her in, in, in one time, they leant over when there was no judges or anybody about and said, we're going to take everything you've got. Well, they did, because they were soulmates. So what is what is Ashford's Law? Ashford's Law is a, a, a firm of solicitors that are rats. I burnt them out for Lloyd, so um, Lloyd sacked them a week after the 22nd of October. I caught them out in high court. So Lloyd took me to court. I said, we believe the loan has been securitised. That went on. Their barrister lied about securitisation assignment on affidavits. Um, we had three bent judges in county court, and we had two good judges. And the last judge, I said, look, I've got a report here from Professor Nigel Harper, who is the ex-head inspectorate for retail banking for HMRC. He's helped jail 13 bankers. He helped Anthony Stansfield with the Lloyds HBOS 6. And um, really decent, really decent guy, one of the top UK professors of banking. I've also had a forensic accountant. And what you've got to do when you go through all this crap, you've got to build a team around you. So the, the biggest problem Lloyds have got is some of the regulation guidance out there that actually come from me. So when they put some of these Muppet lawyers and Muppet barristers on it, one of their barristers didn't know what a promissory note was. When they changed to their new solicitors, he said, did you find the old solicitors hard? And I said, at times they're extremely hard. And he said, oh, what was wrong? And I said, they weren't very intelligent. They don't understand how banks, um, banks, banks don't lend. What, do you, what was the motive for Lloyd's, do you think, in your case? Oh, well, what, what happened was, obviously, 2007, the banks run into trouble from, it was a shoot-off from America. Securitisation is, is the way that banks lend. It's, shad, you know, shadow banking makes up 60% of banking. But no, Lloyd's, RBS, Barclays, they all screwed up. And someone's got to pay. The government borrowed money from Europe, and it had to be paid back. What the banks didn't count on was 2010-11 was the PPI court cases in the High Court under uh, Judge Usley when PPI went from being lawful to unlawful. And in 2010-11, the banks realised we're going to have to pay out tens of billions. So now what's the plan? So what their plan was, um, and this I believe ties in with Treasury as well, and, you know, there's a couple of high-up politicians at the moment, and they're, they're gatekeepers, they're blockers. And so what, what the banks did, how do we get more money? Well, let's start breaking down a lot of the SMEs. So what they did, they do a, um, a thing that trading standards were called bait and switch, which is where they bait you into toxic lending and then pull the rug. So in my case, they promised a loan of 200. They went to 87. They then pulled the rug. We didn't have the funds to facilitate the plan. So you back spiral. They then um, jiggle bits about. The overdraft, we thought, they then placed a BSU and we didn't know. And um, that's where we are. And then, and then what kicks in is the 2006 Fraud Act, where Party A, the bank, sets out to deceive Party B us or any other bank victim um, for the permanent loss of money, uh, property, 
intellectual um, for party A's gain or party B's loss or both. You then need to prove mens rea, which is the mental thought of, well, we can do that because we've got emails between staff that show conceal this, this and this. We've got emails that read the heat is on as they're pushing us into more toxic debt. We've got emails that show Mr. Meelum can't afford the repayments on the loan they were pushing me into. You've then got actus reus, which is the actioning of. So we can show between one lot of staff say and do this, do that to make it more toxic, and then other staff actioning that. But the problem was for Lloyd's, I then got the D's after come through, data subject access request. It took us three and a half months to go through, but then we could see all these gold nuggets, like loans, the £250,000 we never had. Um, loads and loads of other bits, other, other um, actors in the bank that are part of the fraud. And the, and the thing is, with banks, um, you've got civil and criminal fraud happening. So what you've got, you've got maybe local staff that are enticing people in and, and they're doing their job and they're following what the computer says, fill in this form, do this, do that, yet you'd be applicable for that. And then you've got the higher middle, middle management that you don't see and they're the ones that are engineering it. And a lot of their um, planning and bits like that, will be, a lot of it depends on the risk factor. If the bank is in debt itself, they will run the higher risk. What's this meant for you, though, um, as a businessman? You must have been having to spend you know, more time than you would wish on the legal stuff. Well, I'd, I've, I've been involved the last 10 years on a lot of um, property fraud consultations and that sort of thing. So when we realised what they'd actually done to us, and I started looking and analysing the patterns which people weren't seeing, um, it all went, went bong. You know, suddenly it kicked in 10 years of going up to the government and home office and a lot of the fraud consultations that were sort of fairly secret, security and that sort of thing. I always wanted to see consumers protected. And we also had our, our own commercial model to look after, so I got very involved in... In, in, in rightful law and um, making suggestions to make it a, a better industry. So um, when we discovered what had happened, I thought, no, we're going to fight it. You're not going to do this to us. And now what I do, I, I help a lot of the other victims because I know the patterns. So I looked at one today as a result of yesterday, and the guy started telling me bits. And I said, well, it's bait and switch and 2006 Fraud Act. So at the moment, I'm actually enjoying it because... I got Lloyd's elevated to the High Court, which I didn't like. I've seen I've seen off one of their barristers. I've seen Ashford's law get blown out. And to be honest, Lloyd Lloyd's legal team, RBS's legal team, they all do the same, and they all catch everybody out the same way. But with me, I know their patterns, and in and parts of it, I know more than they do about um, property law. So what would you say to listeners now who, you know, to sort of, I suppose forewarned is forearmed, isn't it? So, you know, to sort of be, what to be aware of that the banks might try to pull? Well, the, the whole thing of this asset stripping, it's obviously based on assets that, you know, 95% of it will be bricks and mortar property. And the bank might see, you know, if, if we entice someone toxic debt, um, the other thing they don't do is they don't update the land registry. So when I had meetings with the CEO of land registry, I established with him, his head of legal and um, head ledger clerk, that if the bank doesn't update the land registry that they've sold on the loan, well, they haven't got the loan agreement because they've sold it on. So they don't have the wet ink agreement. So what they do, they bring into court the land registry charge. Well, the thing is, that becomes false because they've not updated it. It'd be like buying a car road tax disc. And when you buy it with 12 months duty, it's correct. Not that we have them now. But the thing is, if you cashed in the duty on it and you had a photocopy, that photocopy may look identical, 100% the same. But the thing is, because the intellectual, the duty is gone, it's false. So with land registry, it's true. But then what happens when they sell the loan on because they've not updated who the beneficial 
owner of the repayments go to, that land registry document that shows the bank as the rightful owner is false. So what I said to the judge, I said, what their barrister wants to do is bring in a fraudulent document to steal my property. And the following week, they um, they sacked their solicitors, Ashford's Law. So I think things to watch out for, Nat West at the moment are running um, an advert, paperless mortgages. I've run the other way from it because you want, you want the wetting signature. And if you can say to the bank, when you found out they've done this to you, okay, where's the wetting signature? They won't have it. So then you've got a big question. Should you even be taking me to court? Because you've done fraud. What about the police and crime panel? Um, and maybe you the can explain. You can explain. Um, you know how even in Somerset has become embroiled in yeah, all of this. Yeah, it's corrupt. It's corrupt. They have got corrupt detectives in there. What Lloyd's wanted, they wanted um, a police force that they could buy off. Because you know, I don't know how many there is. If there was fifty or sixty police forces in the UK, if every time you get a victim, you've done fraud on, if you've got a buy off. Kent Police and you've got to buy Liverpool Police and all that, it'd be impossible. So why not take all, why not set up a business support centre um, in guys that's going to support people that have fallen on hard times? Why are they falling on hard times? That's the first question. But if the victims go to Bristol and then they make it even more toxic, most people just collapse. And, and what the banks want is people with no money so they can't fight it. We we didn't have solicitors. So I've been a litigant in person. I'm sort of the expert witness that a bank would probably want. But they've, they've got me on the other side. Um, so the thing is, if all the, all the um, people that do find out then report it to the police, you want the Keystone cops, the corrupt cops that say, oh, no, there's no fraud there. So it keeps going through court. So then when someone says, but it's criminal fraud, and then the other side say, no, Your Honour, no, my lord, the police haven't got involved. They couldn't find any fraud. Well, if you buy off the, they're covering up fraud with fraud. So over on the Somerset Police have got bent detectives and they're quite senior. And so they can never find fraud. But in my case, I've been an advisor on fraud. So that's why I could quote you an abbreviation of what the Fraud Act is. That's why I know what bait and switch is. That's why Kent Police the other week didn't know what bait and switch was, which is a, a standard trading standards um, term. So, you know, and the whole thing is funneled through. You've got to go to action fraud, and then it goes up to City of London Police. Well, that's a joke, because you've got the Keystone Cops in there. In the Treasury Select Committee the, the other week, you've got Nicky Morgan. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it, but there's a thing called Post-Truth. And post-truth is where you feed people what they want to hear on emotions. Now, anybody listening to Nicky Morgan and the Treasury Select Committee talking to the two key stone cops from the City of London Police, for which he was dressed worse than a, um, a scruffy French waiter. Um, the, the thing is, the, the talk between Nicky Morgan, the chair of the Treasury Select, was all about how rosy it is and how the police are helping the banks load of crap. They are helping the banks, but to cover up the fraud. So the City of London Police will then pass any bank criminality normally to Avon Somerset with Lloyds. Avon Somerset now are even, even if it hasn't gone to Bristol or Avon Somerset, I know a victim. He, his, the, the crime on him happened in Kent. He wasn't an SME. He's a normal chap with a normal job who worked on the ferries. And um, with him, I said, you ought to get your D's out. And we got it. There's applications in there with wrong birth dates on it. There's uh, bits in there where they've just cancelled endowments, so there's no exit vehicle on, on his mortgage. So the scary thing is, Lloyds Bank are not just criminally and civilly fraud going after SMEs. They're also doing it to Joe Public. And with that chap, he went to Kent Police. I went with him to Kent Police HQ. And they said, we're not allowed to touch it. We've been told we've got to pass it to Avon Somerset. So any fraud goes to Avon Somerset. 
and there rubber stamp it that there's no fraud, which is a load of crap. And a lot of people lose their properties and, and more asset theft. What was your experience at the police and crime panel? Because you came right the way over, didn't you, to Western Supermare from Kent? Yeah, I, I come over. I mean, mum is extremely ill at the moment. And, you know, as you know, but the thing is, this has got to stop. We've got to stop these bank coppers. It's like Sue Mount Stevens. She says there's no criminality there. Well, she's either in on it or, or she's thick. And I'm, I'm sorry, I, I had to drive up there. Me and Tracy come up there to basically say, you know, you as a um, police crime commissioner, you've got a duty. And your duty is, I can find me notes, You've got the uh, Police um, Reform and Social Responsibility Act. And that says that the Police Crime Commissioner has got to be a Police and Crime Commissioner. Like a good one, like Anthony Stansfield. They've got to hold the police chief to account. And when his staff don't do what they should be, they hold them to account. Um, you, you've got a, another policing protocol, which is a statute in 2011. You've got the oath of the Police Crime Commissioner. I will voice the concerns of the people and make sure the police are efficient and righteous and all that. Well, they don't, you know. But if you've got bent police crime commissioners, you know, it's like having the full pack, isn't it? You know, you've got the Jace, you've got the Jacks, you, you've got the Aces, you've got the Kings, Queens, and you've got the Jokers. And that's what Lloyds Bank and, and Avon Somerset Police are. So uh, what do you think the extent of the fraud is? Um, I mean, obviously Lloyd's is not the only one that's doing this. RBS have been pulled up sharp over it too. You've got Lloyd's, you've got RBS. Um, as Lloyd's and RBS close up more shops, um, some other banks are opening. And some people are now saying, you know, is there question marks with Metro Bank? I know people have had problems with Santander and um, Barclays. Barclays is another one. Um, but it all seems to be the same patterns. A lot of these bank managers, they move about and they take the bad habits with them. And, you know, does somebody leave one bank after many years in senior position and do they set up sort codes that they can money launder through? Um, and do they leave them sitting there dormant, attached maybe to Overshaw's off-sea accounts? And then do they move to another bank so that when they pay money into wherever it's going, you know, dodgy thing. Like what, say, what about the FSA? Aren't they supposed to regulate banks? The who? FSA, isn't it? Financial Services yeah, Authority? I, I've not heard them doing a lot in uh, regulation lately. I guess you mean uh, find a Financial Conduct Authority. Well, I don't know. They, they oversee a lot of conduct lately. I know there's an awful lot of victims that are losing their homes and going through hell. And they're saying, who is this FCA? The other thing is false. And... What I've worked out with FOSS is if you've got a small claim or dispute, a thousand pounds, thirty, forty thousand pounds, they might agree with you. But then again, if you've got a thirty or forty million pound claim or a ten million pound claim, FOSS will say, "Oh no, we can't see any fraud." Even in my case, when uh, a senior manager at BSU has told a lower manager at BSU to lie to FOSS, and I've got the evidence of it. And FOSS still don't find in your favour. But then again, I suppose a lot of 10, 20 million pound claims but keeps a lot of thousand, five thousand, ten thousand pound claims happy. So what did so, you what did you say? What did you actually say at the police and crime panel? And um, can you just you know see? I mean, did you get basically any? Did you get it's any? Not fit for purpose. That that's the um, that's the sum of it. I pointed out um, a couple of names of bank coppers they've got. Sue Mount Stevens has always gave the statement, oh, we can't see any criminality, we'd look at new bits. And I said, no, it's not good enough. You're not doing your job. You're not fit for purpose. You know, she should be sacked. And if not, the police crime panel um, should invite in Anthony Stansfield. We all trust him. And they should let his police force have a free run, they're a lot bigger, and see what's not been investigated. A lot of us victims have got evidence so look at that and find out why A's on the Somerset can't see the fraud. They're either very thick um, or they're in on it. I know what fraud, property fraud is. I used to advise the government on it. Um, 
it's very funny how a lot of uh, fraud officers in Avon Somerset don't know what fraud is. But even now, they're, they're quietening like Kent Police and a lot of other forces. It's wrong. Shocking. Oh, Fascinating. The only other thing that I can think of... Go on. I know one of the victims, which I also raised, I, I didn't mention the person, but um, it's very interesting that a senior uh, bank manager from BSU is on my DZAR and additionally uh, interviewed another Lloyds BSU victim and they found out he was a, a senior manager from Lloyds posing as a police officer inside the Avon and Somerset Police HQ. How does he get let in? Maybe a bank cop let him in. Incredible. Reminds, yeah. reminds me of KPMG in the Treasury, you know, because the Treasury is supposed yep. to regulate them, you know. There they are wandering around. I think the trouble is, if you look at the FCA, somebody said to me that they've got a very big overdraft with Lloyds Bank. And if you look at the City of London Police, if you were to Google City of London Police, Lloyds Bank partnership, you will see that Lloyds Bank um, sponsors City of London Police for the next three years, half a million per year, to help with fraud. But I wonder in what way to help with fraud. It's definitely not to uh, help uncover it. Avon and Somerset Police and Crime Panel are now investigating Trevor Mealham's claim that the police commissioner, Sue Mount Stevens, has failed to hold our police at Avon and Somerset to account for not acting on evidence of alleged fraud by the Lloyds Bank Business Support Unit based here in Castle Park. I stress we do not support Trevor Mealham's claim, but believe that these claims must be aired and in the public domain, in the public interest. That's all for this week. Dialects Bristol's first weekly MP3 podcast. You can download it to listen on your phone or your car. Subscribe to our email list and listen the week before broadcast if you like at dialectradio one word dot co dot uk. Thanks to our guests. First of all, Brett Christophers, author of The New Enclosures, The Appropriation of Public Land in Neoliberal Britain. And then just now from Trevor Mealham. He's the founder of the Independent Network of Estate Agents here in the UK and former advisor to the British government on property fraud. Thanks also to studio engineers Dave Pazanko and Joss Chivers. Dialects of Bristol Broadband Co-op Production catches on Bristol Community FM 93.2 every Tuesday at noon and anyone can contribute. Contact us through the People's Republic of Stokescroft just off Jamaica Street. They're online at prsc.org.uk or on the phone at 0117 909 6897. If you have some precious time to spare, you can volunteer with us or for hundreds of opportunities elsewhere in Britain via the National Volunteering website, do-it.org. Thanks for listening to Dialect, and I'm Tony Gosling, wishing you a very good week. I'll be back on Friday with my two-hour BCFM politics show, Ofcom Willing, live from 6 till 8pm. Meanwhile, till next Tuesday midday from the Dialect crew, goodbye for now.